Good morning, everybody. How are you? You guys are looking fantastic. Especially you, Ken. You're looking sharp, eh? Why don't you turn around and tell somebody you look fantastic today, would you? Tell somebody. You look fantastic. So, uh, man, I'm so glad to be here. Let, let me just tell you this. This you're a much better looking, good looking congregation than the Southwest campus. I was there last weekend speaking and, oh, this is live, isn't it? I am so busted, yeah. So we uh, started this series last week and I'm really excited about it. It's uh, not what would Jesus do, but what would Jesus say with me? Undo. What are the things that would grieve the heart of Jesus when you read the scriptures, the red letters in the New Testament? You would say, hey, this is something that Jesus Christ truly grieved over. This is something he would want to change in my life to give me something better. Last week we talked about, in week one, we talked about this thing that Jesus would undo, and that is apathy or indifference, spiritual indifference. Today I want to talk to you for a few minutes about hypocrisy. Jesus would undo hypocrisy. I want you to do something for me. I want you to tell somebody around you, this message is for you, not for me. It'll make you feel better, okay? This message is for you, not for me. And, and they're looking at you saying, you're lying. I want to introduce this message to you by telling you a story uh, about myself, a little bit of, uh, well, let me just tell you about it. We used to live out on the east side of town on uh, 178, about a 20-minute uh, drive to, to the southwest campus, and, and one Sunday morning, I'm, I'm getting ready, but I'm running behind. Any of you run late this morning? Yeah, I was running really, really late, and I jumped in my car, and I sped out of the driveway and got out on 178, and I got behind the slowpoke. I mean, it's like easy like Sunday morning for this person. It's not easy like Sunday morning ever for me. It's easy like Monday morning for me. So I get behind the slow poke, and he's just, bah, 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 bah. and finally, I just can't, I, I got a prayer team waiting on me at church. My prayer team, there's 25 people waiting to pray with me, so I, I got to get there, and I'm late. And so I, I look around, nobody looking. So I do my best heaven, uh, Kevin Hardick maneuver, and I go around on a double yellow, yes I did, I sinned. And I came back in, I'm feeling good, I'm be on time, and then all of a sudden I hear the siren. And I see the lights blaring. One of Bakersfield's finest pulls up <laughs> besides me and pulls me over, and I, you know how, anybody in law enforcement here, can I see your hand? Okay, all right, we love you, but we hate you. Uh, anyway, see, you know how they do, they strut up, like got the hand on their pistol, like, you know. Like, I'll let him do something. And uh, he says, your license, I give him my license. And then he starts the slowest procedure you have ever seen, <laughs> like molasses. And I inside, I'm just like, I'm fidgety. I'm like, oh my gosh, these people are waiting. Oh, I forgot to tell you this. Big part of the story is a week before that, I got a speeding ticket at the same spot. I don't ever get speeding tickets, but I get them in, in, in twos, about 12 years apart. And anyway, so I had one before, I'm late for this meeting, and I mean, I'm just like, oh my gosh, hurry up. This guy's slower than the guy I was trying to pass, you know. <laughs> anyway, so finally, this thought, this temptation enters my head. I think, you know what? If I just tell them who I am, that I am Pastor James of New Life Church, and that I'm going to a prayer meeting, maybe I won't have my insurance go up and get the second ticket. Maybe I'll get on time. I don't ever pull the pastor card, but I did. Stupid boy. I said, hey, sir, just want you. He's right. I said, hey, sir, I, I'm Pastor James Ranger of New Life Church, and I'm actually late for a prayer meeting, and I got to preach to a couple thousand people today, and, and he just, this is what he does. I said, could you just give me a warning and let me go? He does, he does like this. He goes, you know, cops have the shades. He goes, Pastor James, you of all people ought to know better. <laughs> Wrote the ticket, gave it to me, and I sped away, tried to get down to the church. 
walked in for, for my prayer meeting, walked in the door, hi, Pastor James, how are you? I lied. I'm awesome, man. The Lord is good, praise God. We're going to have a great day. Today. I was such a hypocrite. <laughs> such a hypocrite. Well, the truth is, we all deal with this I, at different degrees. Jesus would undo our hypocrisy when we claim one thing but we do another now let me begin by saying that we all again it's it's easier to see it in others than it is to see in yourself right it's easier to ah oh, yeah you're dealing with ah oh, you're faking it but maybe inside we're, we're experiencing some of the same things how, how many of you know at least one hypocrite can i see your hand you know at least one one hypocrite how many of you are sitting right next no 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 they're going to point their finger back at you. You know what I'm saying. Yeah, it'd be a big old brawl. That's right, a big old fight. The truth is, some of you, including myself, when we're growing up in the church, we experience some, actually some pain from people that were spiritual leaders in our lives. Maybe it was a pastor or a priest or a spiritual elder or a parent. And they, 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 they said they were this, but then down the road they did something that's the opposite of what they're saying. And it, it, it really can devastate us. It, it can mark us. And in fact, there's some people that literally never go back to church, never come back to God, all because of somebody in the church that was hypocritical. It's, it's a real big issue. Brennan Manning said this. Brennan's one of my favorite writers, and he said this, put it up on the screen. He said, the single greatest cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, then walk out the door and deny him with their lifestyle. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. What would Jesus undo? Jesus would undo hypocrisy. He's very passionate about it. So what is it? What is hypocrisy? First of all, let me tell you, and you may want to jot this down in your notes, let me tell you what it is not. It is not. Hypocrisy is not the disparity between what we do and what we wish we did. In other words, it's not the difference between how we behave and how we wish we would have behaved. You know, I, 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 I wish I wouldn't have said that, but I said it. I, 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 I had that thought, I wish I wouldn't have had that thought. But that, that's not hypocrisy, that's just old-fashioned sinning, and we, we all do that, Yes? Yes? Aren't we all sinners? Well, let, me, let me get this straight. Nobody here has a straight up halo. Not me, not you. All, all of it had just a little tilt to it. You know what I'm saying? Some of us, it's sideways, but you know what I'm saying. So what I'm saying is there's a difference between hypocrisy and just sinning. So what is hypocrisy? This is key. Hypocrisy is the gap between what we show and who we are. What we show and who we are. It's the gap between what we say and how we live. It's the gap between our public persona and our private character. Whenever Jesus railed against hypocrisy, and he did it a lot, it's the number one thing he went after, he would use a Greek word for, for hypocrite, and it's, it, it's simply this. Let me say it. Hupocritus. Hupocritus, and it's almost like hypocrite, right? But it literally means, it literally means an actor or stage player, one who hides behind a mask. Now, if you've ever seen the Greek plays, then you've seen these. This literally was considered the hypocrite. It's the, it's the face, it's the mask. Now, this one right here is the, the angry mask. Now, wouldn't this be cool if I, I gave the rest of my sermon like this to you? Isn't that creepy? That is really, really creepy. And, and, but but the, the, the angry mask is the, is the person who says, you know, hey, you shouldn't be doing that. Don't drink. Don't smoke. Don't chew. Don't run around with girls who do. And then you find out when they take their mask off, they're, you know, got their own addictions and their own problems. But they're wearing a uh, mask. That's the angry mask. Well, this right here is the... Uh, the happy hypocrite. This is the happy hypocrite. This is the person that comes to church on Sunday morning and it's all good. Praise God. Glory. Hallelujah. Yeah, I just got a speeding ticket, but no, it's good. It's all good. Praise God. Hallelujah. You fought all the way to church with your spouse. Oh, hallelujah. Happy, happy, happy. It's easy 
to wear the mask. We all do sometimes. These masks are easy, easy to wear. Paul put it like this. He said, they claim to know God, but by their actions they, say it with me, they deny him. They say they know God, but by their actions they deny him. Jesus, let me just say it, Jesus hated this. I mean, he railed against hypocrisy. In fact, if you read the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, it's his most famous sermon. He really went after the Pharisees. The Pharisees are who? They're the most spiritual people on earth. They look spiritual. They walk spiritual. They talk spiritual. They act spiritual. But Jesus said this, don't be like them. He said, don't you be like them. He said, hypocrisy is when you, you give and then tell everybody you're giving. Hello, I'm giving, I'm a generous, and here's what the amount that I'm giving. Jesus said, don't be like that. He said, don't be like the hypocrites who pray to be heard. Literally, the Pharisees would do what I just saw in Israel two weeks ago. I was in Jerusalem at the Western Wall. And there were three rabbis, and you know they got the long things going on the side, and they got the garb, and they got their disciples, and they made a circle at the Western Wall, and they're, they're shouting their praise. Ah! I was going to bring a video, and I couldn't find it, but I, you need to see this. They're still doing it 2,000 years later. Jesus said, don't be like that. Go into your prayer closet alone and talk to your Father in secret, and then he'll reward you openly. And then Jesus talked about fasting. He said, don't, be, don't fast to be seen of people because that's hypocritical. I'm fasting. I'm doing without food and I'm so spiritual. Jesus one time also said in that message, don't criticize other people when you're doing the very same thing. He said, because that is, that is hypocritical. Now I want you to look at what Jesus said to the Pharisees in Matthew 23. Let's all read this out loud together, ready, Go, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. I'm waiting. Here we go. Ready, go. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. You snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? I think Jesus is ticked off. I think he's ticked off. Jesus is saying, don't be like those guys. But notice that Jesus didn't say, woe to you who say bad words every now and then. He didn't say, woe to you who watch some bad shows on Netflix sometimes. He didn't say, woe to you who had too many green beers on St. Patty's Day. He didn't say, woe to you that do those things. He said, woe to you who do those things and pretend like you haven't been doing them. That's the difference. How many of you would agree that social media is a place where a hypocrisy can breed a little bit? You, you know what I'm talking about. Hey, post that picture on Instagram, the perfect marriage. Me and Lydia, God, we love each other, lovey-dovey-dovey. We post this picture, but just five minutes ago we got into it. Arr, hey, post it, selfie time. Oh, I want you to see my time with Jesus, my devotional time. And so I post this picture, and it's of me. There's my Bible, thick Bible, and I've got my cup of coffee because, you know, in order to have the real look of spirituality, you've got to have the coffee with the Bible. And so I get it staged just right. I post the picture, and it looks like I'm really spending time with Jesus, but I don't tell you on there that I've spent more time staging that picture than I actually have spent in the Bible and in prayer that morning. It's easy to do in our lives. It really, really is. What would Jesus undo? Jesus would undo our hypocrisy. He wants us to be walking in the light, be walking in the truth, and living lives honestly, no matter how good or bad it may be. And again, the truth is all of us deal with this one way or the other. You do, and so do I. That author I quoted earlier, Brennan Manning, put it this way. Brennan Manning said, there is a resident Pharisee in all of us. There is. There's a resident Pharisee in all of us. But here's the good news. This is what I brought you here to hear is this. There's hope. 
for the hypocrite. There's hope for the person that's going through life doing this right here. It's all good. It's all good. Hey, I hate that. Someone says, hey, how you doing? Oh, it's all good. It ain't all good. It ain't always good. No, it's all good. No, it ain't all good. There's hope. There's hope for the hypocrite. Here's what Jesus said. Verses 25 and 26. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you clean the outside. Ever say outside? the outside of the cup and the dish but inside say inside inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence blind pharisee here it is underline this line this phrase first clean the inside first clean the inside of the cup and dish and then the outside will be clean listen here's what jesus says first clean up the inside don't worry about your behavior don't worry about all the stuff out there. He says, let the Spirit of God begin to transform you into the image of Christ from the inside out. Let the Word of God daily begin to transform your mind and have you shaped into the likeness of Jesus from the inside out. And then down the road, people look at you and go, man, what's happening? You, you're changed. What? It didn't begin on the outside. It changes an inside job. It's the spirit and the word inside of us and it begins to transform us and then our behavior is just simply reflecting what's going on on the inside of our soul by the work of Jesus Christ. Jesus had zero tolerance for hypocrisy but he had so much grace for the people that was just honest. Man, anybody who came to Jesus, the ragamuffins, the sinners, the tax collectors, the prostitutes came to Jesus and said, Jesus, I'm screwed up. Jesus said, man, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. It was about just coming clean with God, coming clean with Jesus. Jesus one time said this to the Pharisees because they were pretending like, remember the woman was washing his feet with her tears and she was a prostitute. And the religious folks were going, ah, if he only knew who she was. And Jesus said to those Pharisees, let me tell you something. I didn't come to this earth. I'm a physician. I'm a doctor. And I'm not coming to the earth to those who think they are well. I came to the earth for those who know they are sick. I am Dr. Jesus and I want to change people who know they aren't well and want to get it together. Amen. That's Jesus. Jesus Christ wants you and I to drop our mask. Why? Why? Listen up. Here's why. Because that's when miracles happen. That's when a life change happens. That's when breakthroughs happen. That's when healing and restoration happens. When we drop the mask and we get on as Proverbs 28, 13. Let's all read this together out loud. Ready? Go. Whoever conceals their sins does not prosper but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. Did you catch that? As long as I'm concealing my brokenness and my sin and all that's going on, then I don't, I don't prosper. I, I can't get along in life and be all that God wants me to be. But the moment I confess them and I say, yes, the moment I do this, that's not me. That's not me. This is the real me. This is what I'm going through. That's the moment that I get mercy and grace from God. Now, I want to tell you a story why I'm so passionate about this topic today. As a little boy, I grew up in a church where the church culture was one like the Pharisees. It was a, a holiness tradition, and it, it was all about how you looked, you know, especially the women. Uh, my daddy was the pastor. I had my mom and five sisters, and the poor women, they just like, you know, you couldn't wear pants. You only wear dresses, because that's holy. And we lived in St. Paul, Minnesota, and um, my sisters walked to school in, you know, zero degree weather in dresses, because that's holy. Women couldn't put on makeup. Some of them needed it. I'm just saying. They couldn't cut their hair. Their hairs down here had to be because holiness is long hair. And it wasn't just the long hair. It was, it was you pile it up. 
And the higher that it went, the holier you were. So my mama was very, very holy because she had this bees nest that went like way, way up here. She was a holy woman of God. And all of the guys, the men, we wore the power suits and we called each other brother. Brother, I absolutely did not know anybody's first name. It was Brother Jones, Sister Perkins. I knew him for decades, didn't know the first name ever. They called me at 14 years old, uh, uh, Brother Ranger. That's dumb. Anyways. So I learned as a little boy to do this. I learned that you couldn't be real. You couldn't be honest. You had to put on the religious happy face. It's all good. It's all good. It's all good. And I'm going through my teen years. You know, hormones are coming alive, temptation and sexual fantasies, et cetera, et cetera. And I could not get honest and get real. I just, it's all good. It's all good. Then Lydia and I get married and we move into our, our 20s. And after a couple of years, you know, we're like having some real problems because how many of you know if you keep this stuff inside, you're going to get sick? Secrets kill. And I kept that stuff inside. Lydia kept that stuff inside. And we, we, had, we loved each other, but man, we had some problems. But we had to be the preacher people. And pastors couldn't have marital problems. So Lydia and I suffered in silence. We live lives of quiet desperation. And then one time in my late 20s, Jesus of the Bible, not Jesus of the church, but Jesus of the Bible, began to reveal himself to me. As Jesus, the friend of sinners. Jesus loved the broken people. And I begin to see how Jesus how he would treat the woman caught in adultery. Caught in the act of adultery. And Jesus says, I don't condemn you, go and sin no more. Your past is past. And I saw Jesus, the loving Savior, in a new way. And I finally got the courage one day to go to my good friend Bill Cheney sitting up in Fraser Park at a restaurant and I said, Bill, I'm going to tell you something that I've never told anybody in my life. And I began to confess to Bill the brokenness of my heart and some stuff that happened to me as a kid and how God I know wants to heal me, but I don't know how to get healed. And I sat in that restaurant and I wept like a baby and I mean, it was a cleansing thing. I began to feel this load lift off of my shoulders. Bill laid his hands on me there in that restaurant. He began to pray over me the love of Jesus, the grace of God, the mercies of God. That great gave me the courage to go to a Christian counselor for the first time. I walked into this Christian counselor's office with my mask on and I took it off and I said, sir, I've never been to a counselor before and I understand if you tell anybody what I say in this room, I can sue you. Is that true? He looked at me like, uh, yeah, yeah, that's true. Hey, this guy's a nut job, you know. And I began, I said, don't forget that. Let's get busy. And I began to work on my heart. And for two or three years, I began to take off the mask. And I made, listen, I will never go back to what I was. I will never go back to, I, oh, I, I'm going to pretend. I'm going to pretend. I'm going to pretend. I'm going to wear the mask. It's all good. No, listen, that's not, the, that takes too much effort. And you can't get well. You can't get uh, you can't restore until you make confession of your brokenness, your struggles, your sins. No matter how dark and bad it is, you got to find a safe person. you got to get honest and take off the mask. And here's the beautiful thing. South K, 1988, 30 years ago this year, Lydia and I became lead pastors. But we didn't become lead pastors as well people, but as broken people. And God began to restore my life and restore Lydia's life. And as he restored us and we got honest, then we began to timidly get up before the people and make confession to them. Because I wasn't going to hide no more. I'm a man just like you. Don't ever put me up on a pedestal. I don't belong there. I'm a man just like you. A woman, not a woman like you, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> Come on. Oh my gosh. And I began to just be honest, Lydia did, and now, now, I'm looking at a lot of you that exper have experienced the healing power of God in this house. 
Because not only me and Lydia, but now all of our pastors, I don't allow them to be fake. If you can be fake, don't pastor here. That's what I love about you and, and Joe, Kathleen. You don't fake it till you make it. And because of that, we have a culture at New Life Church. We're a spiritual hospital. It's okay not to be okay. You don't have to come in here and say, praise God, glory, hallelujah. I'm doing great when your world has just been hell. Say, no, I'm not doing so good today. It's okay, because we're fellow strugglers. I'm a rag and muffin, and so are you. This morning, after the first service, I had a 17-year-old girl talk to me, and she said, she's just weeping, I mean, just streams of tears, and she said, you know, in your talk, you mentioned Jesus was the friend of sinners, and he loved tax collectors and prostitutes. He said, I've been in prostitution for the last two years. I mean, I couldn't believe it. I mean, right now I'm holding it together because I could do the ugly cry just like I did with her. Because I went, my gosh, I'm so glad I go to a church where a young lady says at 17, I've been in prostitution for two years, but today I'm coming out of the darkness. I'm taking off the mask. I've been on, a, on drugs, but I'm coming clean today. And I prayed with her, and man, I mean, she had a puddle of tears. I'm telling you, new life, that's who we are. I'm going to tell you right now, we're, we're not a place for perfect people. So if you're perfect, please go to another church because you're going to mess up our good thing. We like a place for imperfect people. It's okay to not be okay. This is our prayer in Psalms 139. Search me, God, and know my heart, not my behavior. Search me, God, and know my heart, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me. And lead me, God, in the way everlasting. Hypocrisy is the gap between what I'm showing and what I really am. So how do we make up that gap? Jot this down real quick. Put it up on the screen. We don't close the gaps with perfection. Give up perfection. Some of you are trying to be a perfectionist. Stop. Give it up. This side of heaven, you won't be perfect. Here's how you, we close the gap. We close the gaps with Christ. Jesus Christ went to the cross, and on that cross, I was just there two weeks ago at Golgotha, and I, as I looked at the skull hill, and I, this is where Jesus died. And at that place, he took your punishment, he took my punishment for all of our shame, all of our, the stuff you don't want anybody to know about because you're so ashamed. Jesus took the penalty at the cross. And he makes you righteous before the holy God. And God declares you not guilty. Not only now, but for all eternity. Because we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I told that young lady this morning, you're justified. Just as if you never sinned. Let that go deep in your heart. You're justified by with God you're put right with God just as if you never sinned because you're covered by the blood of Jesus what can wash away my sins nothing but the blood of Jesus what can make me whole again nothing but the blood of Jesus I hope today you would choose with me because I got to keep choosing to do this Drop the mask. Get honest. Find a safe person, a counselor, a pastor, somebody. Man, I'm addicted to painkillers. My marriage is jacked up. My finances are screwed up. Man, I got the bling, I got the car, I got the house, but I got a, I'm drowning in debt. And the moment you get honest, you take down the mask, you're on the road to recovery. You're on the road to healing and miracles in your life.